All right, so let's begin the uh, next talk in this, uh, the next session in this philosophy track. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, our next speaker, Professor Christine Hauskeller. Professor Hauskeller is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Exeter in the UK. Um, she holds qualifications from University Frankfurt on Main and um, Technical University Darmstadt. She's an expert in the philosophy of science, especially medicine, ethics, and applied ethics, and she has research interests focusing on constellations of knowledge and power, epistemology, and normativity. She worked on the life sciences for two decades, and about five years ago shifted her focus to work on um, emerging psychedelic medicine, animism, and decolonizing approaches, advancing methods and concepts from critical theory and feminism. She's a co-founder of the Exeter Transdisciplinary Research Group on Philosophy and Psychedelics, and she has two recent books, one on stem cell research and uh, one on philosophy and psychedelics, out last year with Bloomsbury. Uh, Professor Hauskeller will be talking about alienation, psychedelics, and connectedness. Over to you. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Um, this, um, there was a discussion of what I would be talking about today, and my broader interest really is in looking at the psychedelic renaissance and the importance that I ascribe to the question of whether we can actually achieve a change in the legislation and regulations on psychedelics going via the medical route and having sort of treatments approved, and this idea that this will change everything. I have great doubts about that, and I've been doing quite a bit of work in the last few years to explain this, and that what I'm doing today is only one small aspect of this. Um, I also, because of the shortness of time, won't have an awful lot of time to really explain alienation very much. I have in this book that Chris thankfully just mentioned, that's out now as a paperback. And if you want, I have a voucher which you can get 20% off of that. Um, but uh, in that chapter, I have explained more on alienation and individualization in uh, psychiatry and clinical medicine. I will only go briefly into this now. But so I will start with access to psychedelics and this political position I'm having that they should be uh, legalized or at least decriminalized. Interesting discussion on this, very difficult, can't get into this either. But <laughs> so thinking about what psychedelics can do and talking about alienation and self-realization with some philosophical comments and then about connectedness and I will end talking a little bit about this research on nature connectedness. Um, the arguments some colleagues, especially from the clinical research space, have been making on nature connectedness, uh, usually with, uh, obviously, participants that were diagnosed with mental ill health. And a little study one of my students did this year uh, that was interviewing uh, a, a pilot study on actually doing longer-term interviews with students who have been using psychedelics and how this really affected their relationship to nature. Okay, so in this ongoing war against uh, drugs and that psychedelics are harmful, I think uh, we can, it, it, it needs to be said over and over again that there's no good reason why psychedelics would be part of this. Um, and the exceptions, however, that are there are actually quite broad reaching and growing dramatically from the exception of use in clinical spaces, in religious spaces, and of course, in entertainment, in festivals and raves. This is not a legal space, but it's de facto a semi-legitimized space, because otherwise they wouldn't be happening all the time and everywhere. So it's quite interesting that <clears throat> we have the seemingly very rigid legislation, but on the other hand, we actually have for interesting reasons, I won't go into either, uh, these exceptions granted to quite powerful and potentially very large institutions and part of people's everyday lives. Um, so what is dangerous about psychedelics? Maybe it's not what happens in the clinic, what happens in the religious uses, and what happens in parties 
maybe what's really dangerous about psychedelics is that they could actually change the way people think about the world in a way that is more radical <laughs> than either of these institutions aim that. This is the argument I'm going to develop so briefly to bring in some philosophers because that's what I do and that's what I like. <laughs> so what is alienating in our culture that actually might need remedying? Alienating, according to the Frankfurt School critical theorists, one book of which is this Dialectic of Enlightenment, in which we find, as in other texts described, the problems with enlightenment and alienation. So there's rationalism, <clears throat> and the oppression of the irrational, that is the magical, the mystical, the emotional. There is a radical individualization in Western modernity, that everything is supposedly in us, coming from us, and it is thinking from Immanuel Kant, you know, the structures of our mind are there, and we cannot understand ever anything that is not already preset by these structures, and you can expand this of our body, of consciousness of the society we grow up in. We are very caged in. There is no outside to this being human, being you. Um, so there is a cutting off of fundamental understandings of sociality as well as humans as being part of nature. And then thirdly, in the capitalist organization of our society, of course, competi competition and marketization play a leading role and they alienate us from not only the products of our labor and the, our ideas, our own emotions, when we always have to prioritize certain strategies for survival rather than actually, well, when partying becomes something you can only do occasionally, that's your little free spot, yeah? And that's why you can do it, but actually changing the fundamental structures is where the real challenge lies. And this is what, of course, these philosophers and me and many others <laughs> are actually interested in. So with respect to the uh, psychology in particular, other critical theorists or works that are relevant here and that bring out some other aspects of this is that on the one hand, society normalizes. That is a critique that we know from the anti-psychiatrists, from Foucault, from the whole medicalization critique in the social sciences and medical sociology that this question is, how, how far does clinical treatment actually go? Is it there? It's main, <laughs> one of its main purposes to actually make you get back to work. Yeah? This is what counts as a successful treatment. You are back into your social relations, you can look after your family, and you can go back to work. This is maybe not necessarily this sort of making you work again within the frame is something that is very strictly criticized here. And when we look at alienation as a symptom of a society that is basically seeing us as functional elements within a bigger infrastructure in which we have certain roles to fulfill, then the alienation of our Another form of self we could be comes with symptoms. And these symptoms line, align very interestingly with many that psychiatrists use to identify which patients now might be tried uh, in clinical trials for psychedelics. But there is symptomatics of anxiety and of depression, of loneliness and of detachment, the existential desperation that many, especially young people today, feel, I think, for very good reasons indeed. It's not an illness for young people to be depressed and anxious in this world. This is a healthy response to the state the world is in. To actually call this a disease is almost offensive in my view. So how can we actually change away from this? There were always subcultures of resistance against the social organization. The whole 20th century is characterized by them. And of course, the hippie movement that supposedly was one of the reasons for prohibiting psychedelics is one of them. Um, now, what might be the changes that we are looking for with psychedelics? And it's interesting that our clinical colleagues are so very busy now doing metaphysics and talking about philosophical questions, especially also issues such as uh, 
connectedness. So there is this interesting finding that actually being out in nature makes people better. Yeah? So the well-being industry has built a lot on this. This is very well established as part of treatments. And we find that on psychedelics too, humans develop a new connection with nature. Importantly, in my framework of thinking that nature is not only that nature out there, that's also the nature that you are. It is the very connectedness of nature that is really the key point here. So, Ketna and colleagues write, reconnecting humans with nature and healing the apparently growing sense of alienation from it should be considered a common and urgent priority area for humanity. Given the demonstrated capacity of psychedelics to oppose this pervasive environmental melancholia by enhancing human nature relatedness, it would seem their widespread prohibition is not in the best interests of our species or the biosphere at large. So drawing this from data out of mostly clinical trial patients is a really interesting broad statement, but as such very valuable. So what does it mean to look at this more closely? I said we have three semi-legitimate spaces. That is the clinic, the church, and the party. And in each of them, there is an interesting way in which they all keep people in line with something. <laughs> One with the festival weekend or the festival week in which anything goes, from which, of course, you ought to get back. Huh? Maybe not quite the day after, but at least three days after. You have to be back. Um, then there is the church space in which you get transcendental experiences in a community in a highly ritualized form usually, in which part of this is also a seduction of working within that apparatus. And some of these new psychedelic churches are actually quite conservative, interesting hybrids of Catholicism and some indigenous elements and very eclectic collections. It's, it's an interesting question to which the form of stability and hold many of my friends find there how much this is self-realization in the more emphatic sense in which i mean it that does not mean it's so bad it just means it's not necessarily this autochthonous self-realization that we might have in mind it's a very, it's very powerful organizations that actually have structures of power they inflict and the same obviously is true for the clinic the diagnosis individualizes and where it is you who is wrong and you who need to be fixed and you need to fix yourself and you get the help you need to just go back to where you ought to be. So in Herbert Marcuse writes in the essay on liberation about psychedelics, a very brief note, um, but he says that he thinks the artificial paradises should really motivate us to work for the revolution against the capitalist framework and the sensory connections or the sensory connectedness we might experience on these drugs might be just a vehicle and that's the only purpose to actually change our ethics. I find that interesting. <laughs> so the science of connectedness then, such as in Ketna, uh, going through a lot of trial data with a lot of patients having some surveys, some questionnaires. You look, there's a lot of work out there which is drawn together in some overview work as well. But the sort of um, nature relatedness in, is usually tied there with in healthy participants, there is an enhancement of nature relatedness. And in unhealthy participants, the nature relatedness experience is directly uh, is seen as an indicator for actually increased mental health as part of the effect of the treatment. Um, the, by fostering, they say, nature relatedness as such experiences may be particularly beneficial not only for individual psychological well being, but also at a societal level and for the biosphere beyond by increasing environmental concerns and asso associated pre environmental behaviors. And uh, the concluding summary is the presented evidence in this article for a context and state dependent causal, e causal effect of psychedelic use on nature relatedness bears relevance for psychedelic treatment models in mental health. And in the face of the current ecological 
crisis planetary health. But how do we get from these clinical trials into actually planetary health and motivating people to do what is needed for planetary health, not to get back to work? There is a huge river we need to cross here, and there is no explanation of how we get there. So there is a question of whether we can look at this aspect a little bit more. And I think the only way to get there is taking psychedelics out of the clinic, out of the church, and maybe even out of the festival. Not because any of these shouldn't happen, but we need more than that. This is not enough. Um, so there is this meta-analysis of a lot of nature-relatedness work. I can't go into this for reasons of time, but this pro-environmental behavior, which is here seen as an effect of experiences of nature-relatedness, is really, this is what you need. You need a change in worldview and behavior. Yeah? So how do we get there? One of my students, um, so you look at this literature, and one point that is striking is, what do we actually mean with nature? There's philosophy. We can write books and books on this. There is lots and lots written about what do we mean by nature. You can see nature as that which we don't fully control yet. I've argued that some 25 years ago. But the other thing is it is, so it's always this external thing out of human uh, experience. But within philosophy, this question of environmental, disconnecting us from nature individually, as well controlling natural functions of our bodies, the natural desires we might have, to also um, externalizing the nature out there as other, uh, has have been seen in critical theory, in feminist philosophy, and I advise to look at Carolyn Merchant's work or Val Plumwood's work on this. Really interesting stuff on how we have ideas of mastering nature and ourselves by actually externalizing them and in the process, losing the connection to who we actually are or could be. Um, so when we look at these uh, studies though that are in these meta-analyses, the concept of nature is really underdefined. It is very broad. It can mean anything from a flower in a, labor in a, in a treatment room or a wallpaper with trees on to actually being outside and outside can mean very different things it can be a nicely manicured garden it can be uh, actually the amazon it can be a desert yeah the outsides you can experience are vastly different and there's something to be said for safe environments <laughs> but it turns out that even encounters with not so perceived safe environments can be quite interesting so the student of mine cordelia uh, did this study interviewing students on who had psychedelic trips on mushrooms about set and setting how they choose where they go what they do and whether they actually feel that these trips have changed their relationship to nature so she finds the important factors that actually affect changes in behavior and perspective on life are the pre-existing opinions about nature that they had and experiences being physically outdoors during the trip made a key difference. The intention a participant had set for the trip affects what happens on a trip, but also the intensity of the trip experience. So set and setting, prior worldviews, intention, etc., give gestalt and character to the trip. And these personal experiences in turn were then determining for a new connection with nature. Some participants reported significant insights and learning that happened through unexpected encounters within a natural outdoors environment. And that actually changed their personal values. And one example for this from her interviews is Cyril, who was lying in a field when insects began to crawl all over him. He contemplated panicking because of his fear of spiders, but then he thought, I'm in their home. I'm lying in their home. It felt like that neural pathway that he was intruding <laughs> had suddenly seared into existence. Um, this changed his experience and led him to continue to treat bugs with respect during his trip, and since then, I don't kill insects anymore. Cyril had direct physic, a direct physical encounter with insects during his trips, which he attributes, it is this encounter 
that he thinks changed his attitude to insects. Um, so another student, Walter, has this from which she quotes saying, the universe is one substance and we are just one aspect of that. There's no longer that separation. It's one thing to conceptually read about it, but what I believe is that what I saw during the trip is roughly analogous to that. Now everything I interact with, animals, plants, even things that you could say are inanimate, I treat with kindness and empathy. Very enthusiastic, Walter. I hope he keeps up the good work. <laughs> but he chose to have very intense trips usually, and he found that in this breakdown of the separation between him as an individual and the collective, between him and this natural environment, he really learned to re-evaluate and develop the desire to work with nature. So, this is nearly my last slide, I think. <laughs> Encounters with what is not self can be really important for changing who we become. And we have the choice to let ourselves get into that space or not. I'm not saying it's a safe space for everybody. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to make it thus. So if respect for nature is desired, psychedelics might be helpful for providing multisensory experiences and encounters that actually teach us something that our culture has systematically uh, been oppressing and trying to get out of us. Um, so playlists and other manipulations of experiences may, from that point of view, at least be questioned in whether they can achieve this very goal. So the danger of psychedelics in a, is a sensory revolution that leads to actual change. <laughs> the clinic, the church, and the festival do not actually go that far. So self-realization in the sense in which I think from Marcuse and other, and many psychiatrists too, and critics of psychiatry have envisaged it, would be something as a respect for nature through connectedness. And in order to get there, we need to decriminalize psychedelics now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Haskeller. I'm feeling very connected to this vase of flowers here all of a sudden. <laughs> um, we have time for a couple of questions. Any questions in the room? Yes. Um, hi. So I don't know if I have a concrete question, uh, but I think we all have experiences in church, clinic, uh, festivals. And I, and I just got a, a feeling of like a call of action from, from you. Um, so we have a room of full of people interested in, in, in I guess, uh, a better world. Do you have a concrete um, action or like uh, advice or, or ask for us as an audience to, you know, uh, move beyond the clinical and um, festival and church environment? Well, one would be we need to take this philosophical exploration of self and world seriously, which we don't, as aside from in big institutions governing them and big money-making machines that run them. Yeah. The other thing is that I have a particular concern with actually the clinical idea of occupying this space, yeah, defining what can happen in the psychedelic space, is, I, I think we need to contain it. Clinical trials can happen. I've argued last year, maybe we should stop them all. And I think there are good reasons why we might stop them all. But if we continue, if we accept that there is this part of the world and there are actually very ill people who might seriously benefit, then that should be in the clinic with patented molecules and LSD let clinicians use the stuff they have, the knowledge they have, and help the people who are desperate and need that help to live at all. Yeah, That's fine. But to think that this medical approach could actually get us to where we want to be, I think is a huge danger. So I would like to keep indigenous uses, personal uses, festival uses, relig religious uses out of this purview 
of this clinical takeover that is looking at ways in which drug access will mainly be controlled in a new way that could be quite problematic. Thank you. Do we have a question online? Is there a question online? No? Okay. So more questions in the room. Uh, here, someone had a question? Hi. Hi, Professor. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, so I think one thing that you keep mentioning is the alienation and, you know, from very, like, a Marxist lens. Um, it's, it's, and this is sort of, it, during a trip that I had as well, this is something that was very revealed to me. However, like, for me, I didn't necessarily feel a call to action. I saw that, you know, all of the apparatus around me was really alienating me and also, you know, society itself from, you know, the, the fruits of the labor, et cetera, right? So how do you fight against this sort of resignation sort of feeling that I had when, when I had this sort of realization or that one may have when they're having a, this sort of psychedelic experience? I think that is really the biggest risk with psychedelics, that we just work on our own consciousness and we can stuck in this high-flying things we might have when we zone out. <laughs> um, but actually, that doesn't change a bloody thing. So how do you move from having great experiences in your head with your eye shades and your headphones on into a world that needs change? We all know this urgently. Yeah? So there is the great risk that the permitted spaces for psychedelics are exactly geared at keeping you just in working on your own consciousness and your own how you feel about things. Nothing wrong, this is very important how you feel about things, but it's important to remember that there's also good reasons why you were feeling that things are wrong <laughs> and they are not in you. <laughs> the important thing is to realize they are out there. It's really wrong. It's not you who is wrong. <laughs> the stuff out there is wrong and needs changing. So I, I think this is an interesting challenge to actually develop this as a political project. As Marcuse said, there is, they could, that could be a step of an experience, of a new aesthetic uh, experience of self and world that might help you move yourself forward to do stuff. But actually just sitting there enjoying the drug is, of course, uh, one way to not do anything and keep the system working beautifully well as it does, selling you microdosing. Ideally, you can do that every day. <laughs> and pay somebody every day and nothing happens. It's great. All right. Well, the final round of applause happened spontaneously. We are actually out of time. Um, thanks very much, Professor Hauskeller. And um, people who didn't get their questions answered, sorry, we didn't have time. But there is a box up the back. You can write your questions down if you want and put them in the box and then other psychedelic experts around here uh, will try and answer them by four o'clock this afternoon, I believe. <laughs>